Thank you very much, Nick. Okay. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Um, I guess I have the honor of, of setting the stage for the rest of the two days. Um, Josh asked me to talk a little bit about uh, the diversity of soils that we have in Minnesota, um, why they're so diverse. And I will say that I've been fortunate enough to spend the last 10 or 12 years of my life studying soils in the field. So I'm a pedologist. So I dig a lot of holes. I'm dirty half the time. And I have to say that Minnesota has by far um, the greatest amount of soil diversity in the United States as we look at a state by state basis. The one exception might be California, but that should really be two states in my opinion, so it doesn't really count. So I think we're in a really unique situation here in Minnesota because we have um, such a diversity of soils and that means that we have to think very carefully about how we manage them because they're very different. Um, so this might be uh, Minnesota Soils 101 for some people. Um, others of you, Josh said, we may have a really diverse range of backgrounds. So um, I understand some people, you know, this may be review, some people it may be new, but hopefully everybody um, can take something away from this and build a foundation um, that will help um, set the stage for all the other speakers that come in the next couple days. Um, so soil has many definitions. Um, there's argue, arguments over whether or not there's soil on the moon, and you know, we spin our wheels talking about what soil is. Um, here's one definition. Soil is the unconsolidated mineral or organic material on the surface of the earth that has been subjected to and shows the effects of alteration by, and then these are our five soil forming factors, parent material, climate, biota or organisms, uh, relief, and time. Um, and we're really just going to focus on two here, parent material, because parent material is really important in Minnesota in understanding the spatial distribution of soils in Minnesota. We have to understand something about glaciations, uh, understand something about the parent materials that our soils develop from, and that has a major effect on soil texture, which is, of course, uh, one of the major parameters that we need to know when we think about irrigation scheduling. So understanding the spatial distribution of soils in Minnesota, uh, parent material is really number one. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about biota and just look at the diversity of soils across the state. Um, so soil texture is, you know, one of the primary, the primary physical uh, characteristic that we kind of quantify in soils. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, uh, have had uh, at least one or two classes in your life where you've talked about soil texture and probably some in the hundreds. Um, but sand, silt, and clay are our size fraction, sand's the largest, uh, anything less than two millimeters. If it's greater than two millimeters, it's gravel or, or a coarse fragments. Um, silt starts at 50 microns, and there's nothing magic about that number except that um, that's where we start not really being able to see particles with the naked eye. Um, so that ended up being a cutoff, 50 microns over a period of 50 or 70 years when we were developing these, these size classes, 50 microns was the silt cutoff. It's about where uh, we can't see them with the naked eye. And then clay is about two microns. That's where our cutoff is, at least in the US system, two microns. Um, other systems in the world have it. And again, there's nothing magical about two microns, except um, that's where particles generally start looking a little bit different. So our sands and silts, usually um, we consider them kind of spherical or cube-shaped for the most part. Um, our clays are usually very different. They're, they're shaped like plates. And that means they have a much larger surface area than sands and silts. Um, and it also means that they end up being kind of the seat of reactivity, uh, chemical reactivity in soils. And then also it means it has a really uh, huge effect on water holding capacity, right? So clay is one of the major controlling factors uh, in water holding capacity in our soils. And so again, clay, about two microns, um, that's the USDA cutoff. So as you look at, at soils that are dominated by these, and I call this um, soil science at 60 miles an hour. So um, everybody in this room knows that if you're in eastern Minnesota and you see um, irrigation, chances are it's sandy soils. Um, and so that's kind of something that uh, gets excited. Students get excited about in basic soils because they say I can drive down the highway and tell my friends those are sandy soils and you know their friends are amazed. Um, right, but our sandy soils are drought prone because, of, because there's very little clay in them. Um, water hole capacity tends to be low. Our silt dominated soils tend to be uh, highly erodible. Uh, predominantly wind is what we think about with, with silt. Um, and one of the other uh, really important things about silt is that it's kind of in this middle size class, right? And so um, there's going to be other speakers that talk about uh, the way that texture is specifically related to water holding capacity. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with that. Um, but silt tends to be right in the middle, and it means that generally in, when we think about plant available water, our silt our loams and silt loams tend to have the highest amounts of plant available water. 
Clay dominated soils, uh, dinner bell soils, that's what I always grew up calling them because um, they're too wet to till before dinner and they're too dry after dinner, right? So they're either so sloppy um, that you sink in them or um, they're like bricks, right? So those are our clay dominated soils. And, and we actually have all of these kind of very particle size dominant soils in Minnesota and then we also have mixtures. Um, so soil texture, again, just a very basic review is where we put all of these, these three particle size classes together, sand, silt, and clay. And the percentages of these classes um, in a particular soil sample determines what the textural class is. Um, in the US system, we have 12 textural classes. Here's our USDA soil textural triangle. An unbelievable amount of work um, over a period of about 60 or 70 years went into developing this textural triangle. Um, I'm sure most of you have used it. Um, so the way that you would use it is if you had a soil sample and it was 15% clay, 40% sand, and 45% silt. Um, you would start on the clay axis maybe, start at 15%, sand 40%, silt 45%, and we end up with a loam. Okay? And the reason that this textural triangle looks like this, because you know, if, if somebody just gave you this triangle and said delineate 12 textural classes, you would probably do it in a very regular way. Right? You would probably draw out very regular geometric patterns. This kind of looks like somebody drank a little too much scotch on a Friday night and just started drawing lines. And sometimes it's, it, we don't know why are those lines there. Well, the reason they're there is because the USDA textural triangle in particular is designed to be used in the field. So the textural classes are designed specifically to relate to how we perceive soil texture with our hands. And so that makes this textural triangle extremely useful. There's other textural triangles in the world. The Germans, for example, um, had a textural triangle about 30 years ago that had 25 soil textural classes. And they were German, so they were all very regular. Okay? <laughs> it was, if you looked at it, it made perfect logical sense. The US triangle does not make perfect logical sense, but the reason is because it's designed um, to match how we feel textures in the field. And so there's a whole uh, like I said, uh, many decades that went into shifting these lines around and making it match up. What that means is it's very powerful. Um, if you're in the field, um, no matter what you're doing, or if, or if you're working with an irrigator, you're working with a farmer, um, or yourself, it's a very powerful tool because it allows us in a short period of time to say something about the properties of the soil um, as you get more and more practice. Okay, so soil texture is probably the most uh, important controlling physical property that we want to understand about soils in Minnesota. And parent material in Minnesota is fortunately highly related to soil texture. So I want to talk about three different kinds of parent materials that we do have in Minnesota. Um, the first is res residual parent materials. We don't have too many of these. Um, this is the way that people usually think about soils developing in most parts of the world. So you start with rock and the rock weathers and it weathers to smaller and smaller and smaller particles and then over time you have a soil overlying a rock. So on the left here, this is a residual soil formed from schist bedrock in Pennsylvania. And then this is a residual soil formed in St. Peter's sandstone, actually right down in um, South St. Paul on this hill slope. Um, this would be an example of the Boone series. But this soil is developed from highly weathered sandstone right below it. So this is a very sandy soil. That's kind of our standard model of soil formation. You start with rock weathers, and then we have a soil. Um, in Minnesota, that's not how things work. So this is a map of depth, depth to bedrock in the state of Minnesota. The red here uh, up in the northeastern part of the state is less than a meter generally to bedrock. These deep greens are over 100 meters. So you're talking 300 feet plus of other material over the bedrock. So knowing something about the bedrock doesn't really tell us much about soils in most of the state, the exception being some soils in the corners. So transported parent materials, parent materials that soils have developed in that were brought in from somewhere else, that's the majority of the soils in our state. And so we have to understand how those soils were transported, how they got there, why they're there, if we really want to understand the distribution of soils in our state and their properties. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about transported parent materials. So the nice thing about um, specifically glaciated areas is that we can kind of think about the relationship between parent material 
and soil texture. So it works both ways. In other words, if I'm in Minnesota and I know something, if you told me where you are in Minnesota and a soil texture, we can probably make a pretty good guess as to what happened in the last glacial era to form that soil. So the, the relationship between texture and parent material is almost one to one in some parts of Minnesota. And so as we think about the textural triangle, we have sorted parent materials which are dominated by one of the size fractions. So these would be clay dominated soils up here, sand dominated soils over here, silt dominated soils over here. So they're sorted. Most of the grains are the same size. And then in the middle are loams and clay loams and sandy clay loams. Those would be unsorted generally, we would think of that. So the transport mechanisms that we have can either sort or not sort. And here's a map of the US, um, just to hammer this point home, the importance of transported soil materials in Minnesota in particular. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this. There's a, there's a dotted black line here. That's the maximum extent of all Pleistocene glaciations. There have been multiple cycles of glaciation. So at one point, um, earlier in the Pleistocene, some of the colder eras, um, glaciers actually reached almost all the way down to the southern tip of Illinois. So there's some glacial periods that have been called the Kansan period, the Nebraska period. Um, the last glaciation, which is known as the Wisconsin and glaciation, is this blue line. That's the glacial limit. That's the limit of the last uh, glaciation. These two colors that you see here, uh, the green I mapped here is all transported parent materials. Not, not saying what they were transported by, not necessarily glaciers, but anything in green here is parent materials, um, soils that have parent materials that were brought in from somewhere else. So the Mississippi River Valley, for example, um, all of the, the marine sediments along the coasts, um, the Central California Valley, and then the glaciated parts of the United States. And then anything in brown is predominantly where we have residual soils, so soils that did develop from bedrock. What you can see is that Minnesota and really the northeastern states um, is in, in Michigan is really we're in a unique place because we have predominantly transported parent materials. So four uh, mechanisms that we think of in Minnesota for transporting uh, sediments and, and bringing in parent materials that soils can develop in. So the two sorting mechanisms are water and wind. And water, um, we'll talk about three different parent materials, alluvium, lacustrine materials, and outwash. And wind, we generally talk about lus. Um, for those of you that don't know that term or aren't familiar with it, we'll talk about it when we get there. Uh, and then we have two kind of non-sorting mechanisms that we think about or, or unsorted parent materials, and that would be uh, either gravity, just things rolling downhill. You can have um, large fragments rolling downhill. You can have some clays that get washed downhill, so you can get a whole mix of stuff at the bottom of hill slopes. And glacial ice, so glacial lobes as they advance, um, they can transport um, materials, and if they don't, if, if the materials are not washed out by water and they're just kind of dumped, we end up with the material we call glacial till, which is this unsorted, um, loamy material that was just dumped out of glaciers. So if we think about wind and water as sorting mechanisms, and we've got sand, silt, and clay here, and then gravel, which is our larger than two millimeter uh, fragments and soils, and we think about water transport, um, clays are suspended longer in water. They're smaller. Um, it doesn't take much to keep clay particles suspended in water. In fact, at room temperatures, it's almost impossible to get all clays settled out of a water column. And anybody who's done the hydrometer method for soil texture knows that um, you can leave a column sitting for months and the clays won't settle out because of Brownian motion, right? Just the temperature, there's just the room temperature, there's enough molecular motion to keep some of these fine clays in suspension. Um, so if you really want to get them settled out, you have to add salt and centrifuge it like crazy and then maybe you can get the water clear. Um, so clays are highly susceptible to stay suspended. In contrast, gravels can fall out right away, almost immediately, right? And so we have this spectrum where the water velocity that's needed to settle these particles is different, right? So for gravels, we can have really high velocity water and gravels will still settle out, right? So we can have a waterfall or waves or really fast moving rivers and we can have gravels setting out, settling out. They won't be carried uh, downwards. As we go downward in size classes, we need lower and lower and lower water velocities to settle them out. So sands, you know, we'll see sands in alluvial plains um, along rivers and, and beaches. Um, silts, usually only in backwaters, river backwaters and some lakes. And then clays, you need very low water velocities to settle out. So clays settle out either in large lakes 
right in the middle, um, or they settle out in the continental shelf, right? So we, we put clays into our rivers here, and they end up in the continental shelf in the Gulf of Mexico. So they're, they're, there's no way that they're going to settle out at those water velocities. So that's a very convenient way to think about um, parent materials, because if we know something about the textures, we can say something about uh, how, those, how those particles got there. On the other hand, wind, um, generally only silt we think about as being highly susceptible um, to transport by wind. And the reason is gravels and sands tend to be too big. So you really need, I mean, you would need a pretty serious storm um, and, and like a hurricane to get gravels flying up, right? And sands, you need a lot higher wind velocities. Silts are kind of this happy medium. Clays tend to be a little bit too cohesive for transport. So they're chemically reactive. They have electrostatic charge, and so they can stick together fairly well. Um, so clay um, doesn't tend to be carried uh, that well in wind. But silts are this happy medium that are highly susceptible to wind transport. So when we think about wind transport, usually we're mostly thinking about um, silts. So we'll talk about each of these in turn and, and, how, and the context of, of what that means for Minnesota soil. So water transported parent materials, um, alluvium is the first one we'll talk about. And this is one that we're all very familiar with. Um, along most river floodplains, we'll see sands, uh, maybe some gravels, depending on the water velocity. And that's alluvium. And alluvium tends to be laid down in stratified layers. Um, these are floodplains from kind of all over the world. Here's a gravel bar from um, the Noatak River Valley in Alaska. And this is a fairly fast moving river. So um, we can get, we get gravel and it's carrying some sands away. So we tend to get this gravel lag on a gravel bar. In other cases where you have lower um, water velocities, you might get a lot of sand as the alluvial material. Um, but again, stratified year after year flooding, uh, bringing material in. And then we'll talk about probably the most important transportation mechanism in Minnesota, um, which is glacial ice. Uh, and glacial till in particular. So again, glacial till is a material um, that we kind of conceptualize as being an unsorted material uh, brought in by glacial ice. Um, so it was not sorted by wind or water after it was um, melted out of the glaciers. And so we usually see coarse fragments in glacial till along with a mix of sand, silt, and clay. So we have loamy textures. Those are unsorted textures. And we could have boulders, right? Or we could have gravel, or we could have clay. So it's a, it's a real mix of materials. So here's just another example of the maximum extent of the North American ice sheets during the last glaciation. There was two centers. Um, the, the lobes that came down into Minnesota were part of the Laurentide ice sheet that came out of the Hudson Bay Center. Um, and as those lobes moved down, um, they started picking up materials. So um, glaciers move because there's a lot of ice accumulation on the back end, and that pushes everything downward with a lot of pressure and a lot of mass. And this is what um, some continental ice sheets look like today. So it's hard to kind of picture what these glaciers would have looked like. This is the best we can do today. Um, this is the Bylot Island Glacier in Canada. Um, this is pretty much a continental glacier. It came out of the mountains, but um, here's a glacial lobe coming out. Um, into a lower part of the landscape and some glaciers in Antarctica. So if we kind of extrapolate this to our landscape, um, this is kind of what these things would have looked like. And so um, this glacier is coming out of the mountains. There's snow accumulation on the back end and it, everything is being pushed downward. And as it's doing that, um, the glacier is kind of like a bulldozer, right? So not only is it pushing things forward, but things are freezing up to the bottom of the ice and that material is being incorporated into the ice as it's moving. So you really can get a whole bunch of different materials mixed up into it. And if that lobe continues to move, it's going to transport materials from way back in the mountains. It's going to transport it out um, into this lower landscape here. So glacial ice is dirty and it's sediment laden. Um, there, is, there are a few examples of, of clean glacial ice, but generally uh, glacial ice has a lot of sediment because it's scouring the landscape as it goes. And what we can see in this glacial lobe as it's moving forward um, are a number of features on the front end of the glacier. So this is, I don't know if you guys can see this, but there's kind of this bulldozed mound on the front of this glacier. And that would be something we call a terminal moraine. So it's the end, the terminus of the glacier. And the glacier's been bulldozing this material forward. And it's this, this kind of hill or this mound. And it goes all around 
um, where the glacial lobe is. So if this glacier melted, that terminal rain would still be there and we would have evidence of where the glacier was. Um, there's an outwash plain. So there's water that's melting and carrying sediment uh, down out into probably a river somewhere over here. And as it's doing that, all that sediment's being deposited in this, in this flat outwash plain. And over here, there's something we would call a proglacial lake. Um, there's, there's a little bit, there's a bump in the landscape here. And so there's water melting off, but it's not going anywhere in this case. So it's sitting in this proglacial lake in front of the glacier. These are all features that we can recognize in Minnesota uh, on a much larger scale from the last glaciation. So again, if we can imagine that glacier and it, it gets to a maximum point and it's bulldozed all this material in front of it, and that's the terminal moraine. And then a lot of times we think, it, we talk about glacial advances and glacial retreats, and I think it doesn't really do a lot of justice to talk about them um, in such a rational way because um, these things are moving in fits and starts, right? It's not, it's not this nice advance and then this nice retreat. And in fact, a glacial retreat um, can be very chaotic and very messy, right? And, and the glaciers don't really retreat, they just melt, right? So they're not, they're not nicely moving backwards. They're just dumping sediment. They're dumping all the stuff that they carried out. And so behind the terminal moraine is gonna be an area where we will tend to see glacial till parent materials. So, Anything that wasn't sorted by wind or water, that was just kind of dumped out of the ice, um, that's going to be glacial till. And as the glacier moves backwards, we're going to continue to have glacial till exposed. So in Minnesota, uh, we have a really interesting um, divide because we had two kind of main geographic sources of ice. And one from the northwest um, went over the Riding Mountain Provenance and Winnipeg Provenance rocks, which basically are are carbonate rich um, shales and, and sedimentary rocks. And so this glacial till tends to be high in pH. Um, it also tends to have more clay in it because those sedimentary rocks and shales, shale's just a clay stone. So as a glacier grinds it up, you are gonna tend to have more clays uh, in the glacial till. In contrast, um, our northeastern source tills, uh, the superior lobe, what we would call them, uh, went over igneous rocks, iron-rich igneous rocks. And so they tend to be sandier. They also tend to have much lower pH. So we, we see less clay in the tills that are sourced out of the northeastern part. So Des Moines lobe, um, generally what we would call our, our northwestern source tills, and superior lobe, generally what we would call our northeastern source tills. Um, if, there, if there was a uh, superficial geologist in the room, they would probably hammer me on simplifying it to that extent, but I think that's all we need to know um, for what we're doing here today. So these are just some examples of what tills in Minnesota might look like. Um, here's a soil formed in superior lobe till. Um, these are loamy textures, so they're unsorted. And what you can see is there's coarse fragments, right? So these are loamy textures, unsorted soil textures. And here's, here's a coarse fragment, here's a coarse fragment. You can see coarse fragments all over the place. So this is an unsorted parent material. Um, and then here's just an example of the two different um, visual characteristics of our tills in Minnesota. So a lot of times the way that we differentiate these in the field is Des Moines lobe tills tend to be yellower uh, and they, they have carbonates so we can use acid and if it fizzes, um, we know that it has carbonates in it and so Des Moines lobe tills are yellower. Um, they tend to have more clay in them so they'll be clay loams, um, silty clay loams sometimes. And then superior lobe till is redder, went over iron rich igneous rocks. And again, less clay, um, non-calcareous, does not have carbonates in it. And so we can kind of start dividing these things in the field. So we had to talk about glacial lobes and glacial till to understand these other, water trans these other transportation mechanisms. So the second water transported material we'll talk about is outwash. And outwash is nothing more than alluvium, except um, it was deposited by sediment laden meltwater out of the glacier. So the same mechanism as alluvium, it's just rivers or streams running out of the glacier carrying sediment and it's being deposited in a floodplain, but this time it's material that came out of a glacier, not a modern river. So that's kind of how we differentiate that. So the materials are going to be fairly similar to alluvium, sands and gravels. Um, and here's another example. If we use our, our diagram again, so we had a terminal moraine, the glacier's retreating, and in some places where the meltwater can burst through the terminal moraine, um, we'll have a lot of uh, these braided streams that can start moving across flat parts of the landscape and deposit sands and gravels in a big plain. 
Here's some modern outwash plains coming out of glaciers. These are in Iceland uh, and Greenland. So here's some sands um, from outwash sediment in Greenland. Here's an outwash plain in Iceland. So the glacier's actually over here where you guys are and all the melt water's moving this way. You can see this vast plain that's full of sands and gravels because over time those streams are migrating and they're just carrying all the water, uh, all the sediment out of the glacier. Another example of a, of a braided outwash plain. So very flat landscapes, um, broad landscapes, sands and gravels. So we've got an outwash plain right here. Um, the Anoka Sand Plain is generally um, considered to be, in most parts of it, an outwash plain. In some places there's some windblown fine sands. Um, just, north, just north of the, of the cities. Um, so here's a soil, the Zimmerman soil series. Um, very extremely sandy. These are fine sands um, all the way. Some people think these are not very exciting soils, but um, depends on your perspective, right? They actually can be really cool soils if, if, you, if you're used to looking at them a lot. These weren't formed because of the lakes, were they? Generally not, no. So, so this, generally the Anoka Sand Plain is considered to be a large outwash plain. Braided streams depositing all the material. Which is why it, yeah, it tends to be. But there are some areas where there was some, there's some dune action. And so you can, in some parts of the Anoka Sand Plain, you'll get some dunes. Uh, okay, third example of water transported materials are lacustrine materials, so deposited in lakes. Now, we're going to talk about one specific example of this. Um, you could have lakes of many different sizes um, that may be. Uh, may have water that's moving at different velocities, but if we think it of a very large lake, um, generally in the center of that lake bed, only clays and fine silts are going to settle out. So these are the environments where we can actually get parent materials forming that are clay dominated um, and very sorted. And so we have a really good example of this in Minnesota. Here's, no, we don't, don't worry about all the text and everything like that, but basically, about 13,000 years ago, the Des Moines lobe hit a maximum. And it's called the Des Moines lobe because the terminus was actually right near Des Moines, Iowa. So it went all the way down into Iowa and it's this odd shaped thing. And as the climate started warming and the Des Moines lobe started retreating, so here's 13,000 years ago, here's 12,500 years ago. Now the Des Moines lobe went from Des Moines to southern Minnesota in about 500 years. And it continued to retreat. And right here at Browns Valley, Minnesota, there's a continental divide. And all of the water, once the Des Moines lobe got here, all the water that was coming off of, of that glacier got trapped. And the Des Moines lobe continued to retreat, and that water continued to be trapped. And we have one of the largest um, glacial lake beds in the world um, right here in northwestern Minnesota. So the, the glacial lake was called Glacial Lake Agassiz. Um, about 10,000 years ago, it was at its maximum extent, um, and it was humongous. So if we could fly over Glacial Lake Agassiz 10,000 years ago, Winnipeg would have been completely underwater. Uh, Grand Forks would have been also underwater, somewhere off the picture here. And then here you can see, here's the glacial ice, right? So there's still glaciers to the north, and they're melting because the climate's warming, and they're contributing more and more and more water to this glacial lake bed. So the water kept accumulating. Um, and it accumulated predominantly the, the south drainage to Glacial Lake Agassiz was right here in Browns Valley, Minnesota. And th so this is kind of, this picture's kind of flipped around. So this is the Red River flowing north um, towards Hudson Bay. And that is the Minnesota River going south to the Gulf of Mexico, Browns Valley. And this is the Continental Divide, so it's a watershed boundary. All the water from Glacial Lake Agassiz piled up here, and there was a catastrophic flood. So that, that dam, the natural levee, was breached, and a lot of water poured out of Glacial Lake Agassiz down into the Minnesota River Valley in a very short amount of time. There were some other drainages. This, is the, this purple here is the maximum extent of Glacial Lake Agassiz. So this is a huge, huge body of water. There were some other drainages that are now recognized. Uh, the Minnesota River happened to be one of the largest drainages of, of all the water in this lake. So all of this water is piling out through the Minnesota River Valley. Um, and it cut the Minnesota River Valley in, in a tremendous way. So we can recognize this today, and I don't have a modern picture of the Mendota Bridge, Highway 55, but what you notice if you go over that bridge is one, it's, it's very long. You guys know the bridge I'm talking about, Highway 55 down, if you go south from St. Paul. Um, it's very long, and the river itself, when you're driving over it, is small, it's tiny. Right? So the bridge, 
goes from one side of the floodplain to the other, and the floodplain's below you, and the river's tiny. So there's no way that that river cut that huge valley in 10,000 years. It was cut because of these floods, the flood of water that came out of Glacial Lake Agassiz. In contrast, the Mississippi River, we would call a fitted river because if you go over any bridges over the Mississippi River in the cities, it's about half that length, maybe even less, and the rivers are fitted, right? So you drive over the Mississippi River, and generally the Mississippi River is about as wide as the valley. And that's because there was no huge amount of flood water pouring out of the glaciers through the Mississippi River Valley. So we have this real contrast of these river valleys shaped by the emptying of this glacial lake. So, well that was a, I digress there, but it's exciting. Um, so the, what we do have, um, in, so we have this huge glacial, glacial lake, and in the center of that lake, water velocities tend to be very low. So we deposited very well sorted clays and fine silts. And so when we think about um, Glacial Lake Agassiz, really the central part of Glacial Lake Agassiz, the Red River Valley, flat, high clay. I mean, these soils, these soils are vertisols for anybody who's scoring soil taxonomy at home, which means that they're really high in clay. Um, and we, most of us who have, have worked up there, or even took a trip up there, you know how flat the landscape is because it was a lake bed. In fact, it's one of the flattest landscapes in the United States, about a foot per mile in the center of the valley. So very, very flat. Um, we need large tires. Um, we grow sugar beets up there, right? So they're difficult soils to manage. Um, here's the Fargo soil series, a terrible picture of it. Um, but this is the center of Glacial Lake Agassiz, and these are lacustrine sediments. So we're done with all our water, we're done with glacial ice. Uh, our one wind transported mechanism and parent material we'll talk about is windblown silt, which as a parent material we call LUSS. It's a German word. Um, let's pronounce L-U-S-S, LUSS. And generally, wind transported materials are very rich in silt, silts and silt loams, and they're highly sorted. So we see almost all um, silt in our particle size fractions in wind transported materials. And the way that we get these silts picked up, in, at least in this part of the world, is these large outwash and alluvial plains. Um, this, is from, this is in Denali in Alaska. So here's this large alluvial plain, these braided streams. And this contains some silts. So this, this whole alluvial plain contains some silts. And if it gets windy, you can start picking these silts up. And this happens at a lot of different scales. There's, there's dust and, and silt transport on a global scale from the Sahara Desert. Um, over to eastern, uh, the eastern United States and some islands in the Caribbean. It's actually important for soil formation. There's regional silt transport. This is in Kuwait. There's a kind of hazy silt storm going on there. Um, and we have transport at more local scales. So if we have these, these alluvial plains and they've got silts and we get some wind, we can see silts being picked up, right? And they get carried um, because they're the right particle size to be carried by wind. So we have a large amount of LUS, um, especially in the central part of the United States and in the Mississippi River Valley. Um, here's some LUS deposits in Mississippi. There's the LUS Hills of Iowa. Anybody that's driven through that landscape, highly um, silt-dominated soils there, accumulated from, from wind deposition. Um, and then we have some unrecognized, um, we had this big glacial lake bed, so there is actually some silt up in northern Minnesota, although generally it's not mapped. Um, anywhere you had materials sitting out, um, that were exposed to wind at the time of, of glacial retreat in these harsh climates, we tended to get materials moving around um, and depositing silts and lusts. So our last and, and probably um, least, at least on a, on a large scale uh, parent material, would be colluvium, which is gravity transported material that's material rolling down hill slopes. So, you know, colluvium generally is only going to be at local scales, hill slope scales, the bottom of slopes. But one thing that's a very characteristic uh, property of, of colluvium is that we have coarse fragments that can roll downhill by gravity. Then we can get some slope wash, right, if we have exposed material on a slope, and we can get some maybe sands and clays, and then maybe you have another period where coarse fragments are rolling down. So we, these, these parent materials tend to be very unsorted, similar to glacial tills, in that, in that they have a lot of different particle sizes and coarse fragments in them. So here's a hill slope that's generating colluvium, and, and here's some colluvium um, at the bottom of this hill slope. So 
If we put this all together, um, we have a very convenient way of thinking about the relationship of soil texture and transport mechanisms and glaciation in the state. Um, so our clay dominated soils, they're sorted up on this side of the triangles. These would be our clays and our silty clays. Um, they generally have been deposited in slow moving water and these would be our lacustrine sediments. So if you go up to the Red River Valley, you're going to have clay and silty clay textures generally. On this corner of the triangle, we've got silt dominated soils and silt dominated soils are, have predominantly been transported by wind. So these are our lust soils. So anytime we see silts and silt loams in Minnesota, we start thinking about LUS, wind transport. On the lower left-hand corner, we have our sandy soils. So whenever we see sandy soils in Minnesota, we tend to think about alluvium or outwash. The only difference being that alluvium means that it's being um, currently deposited in an active floodplain. And well, an outwash would be something that was deposited from uh, meltwater from a glacier. But the mechanism is very similar, right? So our sandy soils are either alluvium or outwash. And then we got this whole area in the center, loams, clay loams, sandy clay loams sometimes. Um, and that would be our glacial till. As we think about Minnesota on, on that scale, glacial tills are going to be these textures. If you're at a local scale, you might see these textures at the bottom of hill slopes, um, colluvium. So that's the fantastic thing about doing soils in Minnesota is that we have a textural triangle that's designed to be used in the field and we have almost a one-to-one -one match between parent materials, transport mechanism, and texture. So we can go to the field in Minnesota, at least in, in the area that was glaciated, um, assess what the soil texture is in the field and without knowing anything else can at least say a, a most probable cause of transport or, or how did this, this parent material get here. Um, the last, and this is probably not important at all for this crowd, but um, we do have the largest area of peatlands in the country in Minnesota, um, another highlight of the diversity of soils in our state. So organic materials would be the, the third kind of parent materials that we think about for soils. We do have a whole soil order, histosols, um, which include soils that are dominated by organic materials. So these are, are peatlands that have accumulated organic materials, mostly in, in northern Minnesota, the Red Lake peatlands, um, parts of Glacial Lake Upham. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out. Not, not so important for irrigation. We're probably trying to drain these things if you're doing that. Um, so this is a map of the distribution of parent materials in Minnesota. Um, and I know you probably can't read that, but I'll just make some broad generalizations here. Um, so outwash and alluvium is this, is this gold, uh, outwash, sorry, is this gold color. And alluvium is just along the, the active um, river floodplains here in this yellow. So outwash and alluvium are kind of scattered throughout the state, right? We can find them almost anywhere. If we have an active um, floodplain, we'll find alluvium. And outwash um, was kind of mixed together with these different glacial episodes. So we see this kind of scattered pattern of outwash across the state. Here's the Anoka sand plain. There's a big, um, big outwash um, component there north of the cities. Generally, um, except for this little spot here, this little yellow spot, all this red is superior lobe glacial till. So in the northeastern part of the state, those northeastern source um, glacial lobes came in and we have um, superior lobe glacial till. We've got organic soils uh, up in the Red Lake peatlands, but also a lot near Grand Rapids. Uh, there's a lot of peat mining operations up there. Des Moines lobe covers, uh, covered the majority of the state except for the very northeastern portion. And so we have a large exposure of, of Des Moines lobe parent materials and glacial till uh, mostly in, in the southern part of the state, it's almost all Des Moines lobe till. Uh, and then as we get to the central and northern part, it's mostly in the, in the western part of the state. And then we've got the central kind of lake bed of Glacial Lake Agassiz where we've got these lacustrine sediments up in the Red River Valley. And finally, we've got these two little corners um, that were not glaciated in the last glacial period in the southwest and the southeast. So they were glaciated in previous glaciation. So they have older glacial tills, but those tend to be kind of patchy. What we usually see um, in the southwest and southeast is LUS. So this is kind of the only place in the state where we would see a lot of LUS because it wasn't covered over by glaciers. So very quickly, um, the, the second one we'll talk about is organisms. And this is a simple one in Minnesota. Um, we have a, a major divide 
at least in pre-settlement vegetation between forests and prairie. Um, so, so forests mostly in the northeastern, north central part of the state, that's this green here. Prairie um, in the yellow in the, the western parts of the state and, and the southern part of the state, mostly prairie historically. And then a transition between the two, which is sometimes called the, the tension zone, a zone of savanna, sometimes forest, sometimes prairie, sometimes a little bit of both, depending on the climate. And forest and prairie soils look very different. So almost regardless of parent material, um, prairie soils are usually much higher in organic matter, um, and they have a higher pH um, than forest soils. And the reason for that is that prairies, although if you look at the standing stock of biomass in forests, um, there's more, right? So you look at how much biomass is actually above ground or even below ground in roots in forests, and there's more. Um, but the difference is in prairies, uh, there's a lot of fine roots that die off every year, and there's a whole range of estimates of what proportion of prairie roots die off every year, but some estimates place you know, almost 80 to 90 percent of the fine prairie roots die off every year. And that's, so that's a direct input of organic matter into soils. In contrast, in forests, um, there's a lot more coarse roots, and those don't tend to die every year. And so you don't get this very fine, um, um, easily decomposable input of organic matter into these soils. So forests tend to be lower in organic matter generally, thinner on uh, what we call A horizons, the, the darkened material at the surface. Um, we tend to have more leaching in forests. So because prairies um, usually have a nice um, litter cover and they have fine roots and they can um, retain water better just because of the vegetation, um, less of the water is gonna make it all the way down. In forests, um, it's easier to leach materials. So we usually have a very thin um, organic rich horizon in the surface and then something that looks a little grayer, more leached, which would be an E horizon in a forest. So. <laughs> Just based on soil morphology, we can make some guesses about what the historical vegetation was that soils formed under. And they can, they can lead to very different um, soils in the end. So if we put this all together and look at the geographic distribution of soils in Minnesota, there's really six soil orders that predominantly make up uh, most of the soils in the state. So mollusols, these are grassland soils that have very thick A horizons, a lot of organic matter accumulation. Alphasols are our forested soils. These are um, relatively fertile um, um, soils, at least on a global scale, um, of deciduous forests. We've got our histosols, which are our organic soils or our peatlands. Vertisols are soils which are very high in shrink swell clays, and so these are um, the, the soils that would be in the Red River Valley, um, where we have lacustrine sediments generally. Inceptisols, you can't really read that. These are very weakly developed soils, um, typically uh, we only see inceptisols in the northeastern part of the state where we have very thin glacial till and not a lot of soil development going on. And then finally, entosols here in the bottom are usually the soils that we see in outwash or alluvium, very sandy parent materials. There's not a lot that goes on um, in sandy parent materials, so they tend to be really weakly or almost undeveloped soils. So here's a map of our soil orders in Minnesota. Um, and I'm just going to highlight these six. Um, our mollusols are generally where we had prairie vegetation. And because um, the Des Moines lobe, which is high in uh, carbonates, very rich, high pH, high in clays, also coincided with this climatic divide where we had prairie vegetation, most of our mollusols tend to be pretty fertile soils, loams, clay loams. Um, some of the clay loams, like down by Wasika and some other areas, some of the glacial till can be pretty dense. If, I'm sure some of you are very familiar with that. So it can have an impact on water movement, depending on how the till was actually um, deposited. Um, but usually our mollusols in Minnesota are, are comprised of Des Moines lobe till, and they were developed under prairie vegetation. Our alpha sols, this is one of the hazards of doing, being a Mac guy and putting your PowerPoint on PC. This kind of thing happens. But, um, alpha sols are forested soils, uh, and so these, you know, the, the climatic divide for forests, which covered uh, a lot of the north central part of the state and the eastern part of the state, we see alpha sols on both superior lobe and Des Moines lobe tills. So we can see alpha sols on both types of those glacial tills, again, developed under forest vegetation. And the important thing about alpha sols is that because the soils tend to be more leached, um, we usually have a clay enriched horizon in the subsoil. And so you can have um, 
uh, different soil textures in the surface than you do in the subsoil, which has an effect on water movement. In mollusols, we don't see that as much. So mollusols tend to be more uniform in texture as you go down the profile. Inceptosols, predominantly only in the, in the northeastern part of the state where we have very thin sediments to bedrock. Um, these were developed under forest vegetation and predominantly only made of superior lobe till. Our vertisols in the Red River Valley, um, these are lacustrine deposits uh, that were deposited in the center of the lake bed of glacial lake agassiz, our fine silts and clays. Our entosols, which are outwash and alluvial sand. So terrible uh, color choice here, but there's, this, there's the green um, kind of in the same place there was the gold on the other map. These are our scattered areas of outwash and then current alluvial deposits. Uh, most of these are entosols, which are, are highly sandy soils. And then last but not least, histosols. Um, because we're in Minnesota, we have to talk about it. Peatlands and, and our deep organic deposits in the, in the um, Red Lake peatlands and then uh, near Grand Rapids. We have a, a large area of peatlands as well. So that's kind of a very quick, uh, broad overview. I'm happy to discuss more of anybody's experience with your own soils in your region. I'm not, I may or may not know things about them. Um, but thanks for the opportunity to come talk to you, and um, I'm not sure what else you have for this, Josh. Do you guys have specific questions for Nick about the formation of soils in Thank you very much. Yeah, Take a quick break. Um, we'll get one here in about another five minutes. Thank you so much. Yeah, was that right? Yeah, I can't remember what No, that was perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. I grew up about nine miles from Browns Valley, so this is all very interesting.